Legend lives on. It's hard to think of a car that arouses as much emotion and has earned as many superlatives as the Corvette. It's the only sports car that's been in continuous production now for nearly 50 years. It was and remains the ultimate sports car, and without doubt the most American. The Corvette can look back on a stirring history, with the boundless boldness of its breathtaking lines, its sensational technical innovations, and above all, its huge racing success around the world. Even though very early on the Corvette's career looked like being short-lived, on its 50th anniversary, this super sports car is more up-to-date than ever. A special model, meticulously balancing performance, style and comfort the defining characteristics of the Corvette for half a century. The 50th anniversary special edition is distinguished by the unique wine red finish, the Jubilee badge, the champagne colored aluminum wheels, and the elegantly sophisticated shale gray interior. Only a limited number of the special models will be available in Europe in the Jubilee year. A particular highlight on board the advanced magnetic selective ride control. This state-of-the-art system seamlessly adjusts the shock absorbers a thousand times a second to give even more precise handling, especially when maneuvering in the high speed range. The necessary power and the typical small block sound come from the famed 5.7 litre V8 344 horsepower engine. But let's go back to the start of the Corvette story, at a time when stunning women and sexy singers held the public enthralled, another sensation took hold, the passion for fabulous sports cars. Now touring America's principal cities, General Motors' 1953 Motorama is attracting crowds like this one of 55,000 New Yorkers who throng to the wall of Astoria on opening day. The spectacle was mounted in the ballroom of the luxury New York Hotel and had little in common with the sort of motor shows we're familiar with today. Staged like a huge fashion parade, the Motorama served principally to introduce the latest creations of General Motors chief designer Harley Earl and arouse the public's enthusiasm for new technical advances. Interest was correspondingly great and not just among the specialists. But in January 1953, it wasn't only the attractive dancers and intriguing prototypes that drew people to the Motorama. Most were particularly keen to see the new sports car by Harley Earl, which General Motors had promised to unveil in New York, the Corvette. It was the very first genuinely American sports car. All previous two-seater roadsters had come from Europe. Public response was certainly enthusiastic. In the light of the overwhelming reaction, General Motors were quick to launch the series production of the white convertible. By the end of June 1953, the first 300 Corvettes, named after the Navy's fastest ship, were rolling off the conveyor belt. At first, there was just a six-cylinder engine with two-speed transmission under the bonnet. Earl had pushed through his idea of building the series models out of fiberglass, just like the prototypes, a real sensation at the time. But because of its rather sluggish drive, the Corvette was initially a genuine sports car only as far as looks were concerned. That was soon to change.
The Corvette owed its baptism of fire, its emergence as a genuine sports car, to the engineer and successful racing driver Zora Arcus Duntoff. He developed a new camshaft for the GM small block V8 engine and built it into the Corvette. With this light and more powerful drive, Duntoff set up a new mile record in 1956 in Daytona Beach. The Corvette became the first American car to achieve 240 kilometers per hour. The sensational success at Daytona Beach and Zora Arcus Duntoff's racing passion continued to move the Corvette on in the years to come. In 1957, three Corvette Supersports entered the 12-hour race at Sebring. It was here that Chevrolet first took on the challenge of the then dominant competition from Europe with cars specially designed for racing. It was Duntoff who convinced them that a sports car would only become a public favorite if it enjoyed success on the racing circuit. Despite various problems, the Corvette Supersport put on a spirited show. Blocked brakes meant that drivers Thompson and Andre repeatedly had to pull into the pit. Nevertheless, their performance brought them victory in the GT class. The broad blue double stripes set the style for a whole generation of Corvette racing cars. Early summer 1960, the Corvette sets out to conquer Europe. Three racing cars land in the transatlantic port of Le Havre and head off inland. Their destination, the small town of Le Mans, and the world's most famous and toughest 24-hour race. Arcus Duntoff was also on the spot to present the sports car that he'd always dreamed of, one that would be a match for the great rivals of Jaguar and especially the Ferrari Testarossa. While racing stable owner Briggs Cunningham's team got ready for the start, people arrived in their thousands. European interest in the American racing car was enormous. They appraised the voluminous V8 engine in amazement and were fascinated by its sound. The Corvettes, given the starting numbers two to four because of their Le Mans premiere, immediately commanded respect from the start of the race, battling for a place among the leaders from the outset. But the Americans were also fully aware that in a 24-hour race, it's not so much peak performance that counts as reliability and staying power. But the engineers had obviously done their homework. Under the watchful eye of Zora Arcus Duntoff, the Corvette, with the starting number three in particular, managed to hold its own against the strong competition. This was something that not many Europeans had believed the American newcomer capable of. But then, the rains came down. With poor visibility and aquaplaning, several competitors left the road. The race ended nevertheless with a very good result for the Corvette. The best one landed eighth in the overall placings and ahead of many of the best sports cars of the day. Rain again and once again in Le Mans. It had taken 40 years for the Corvette to return here. After a respectable third and fourth place in the GTS class in the year 2000, in the following year, the C5 racers underwent one of their toughest races. The non-stop rain and the duel with the Viper demanded everything the Corvette team had to give. But by daybreak, they could feel that their fighting spirit was going to be rewarded. For the first time in 2001, the Corvette pulled off the double victory in its class and the following year was able to repeat this great result. To date though, the Corvette has scored its greatest successes on the American high-speed circuits. 
In 1998, General Motors developed an official works racing car for the first time. Since then, the C5R has been demonstrating just how powerful and breathtaking the Corvette is. Two thousand and one finally saw the crowning to date of the Corvette's racing success in the USA. The 39th edition of the Rolex 24 at Daytona is all Corvette. With both teams out front, General Motors wins the Daytona 24-hour race. Very near the place where 45 years earlier the Corvette underwent its baptism of fire with Zora Arcus Duntoff and the Flying Mile record. Whatever passion they feel for its abundant stroke volume and horsepower, genuine Corvette fans love their sports car first and foremost for its thrilling design. The introduction of the second generation in 1963 added a coupe version to the existing convertible. The legendary Stingray, based on a racing car which the new chief designer Bill Mitchell had developed back in 1958. Mitchell, himself a passionate motor racing fan, was to turn this racing car into the most exciting production car ever built. The Stingray profited enormously from the advances that had been made by engineers in working with fiberglass. The famous divided rear window of the first series, however, was sacrificed a year later for the sake of improved visibility. 1965 also saw the appearance of the Corvette Big Block with 425 horsepower. While sales of the second generation Corvette were booming, Bill Mitchell was already at work on the next. His Marco Shark II study is living proof of his creativity and his desire to go beyond the narrow bounds that had so far dominated automobile design. The Marco Shark is powerfully reminiscent of the slender outlines of Caribbean sharks, which had been Mitchell's original inspiration. But that didn't stop some people reading a female body into the highly feminine lines. Sophisticated details, perfect finishing and the extremely erotic look fascinated the public at the time. Finally, by the end of 1967, the time had come. Chevrolet unveiled its 68 model, the third generation Corvette. The exciting Coke bottle shape was an instant and huge hit. The coupe, with removable rear window and two-part T-top roof, was soon selling better than the convertible. In 1978, marking its 25th anniversary, the Corvette premiered as pace car in Indianapolis. General Motors produced a special edition for the occasion. But then, the oil crisis hit, together with anti-smog campaigns, and it was time to say goodbye to excess horsepower and the legendary big block engines. The fourth generation of Corvettes was given a sensational launch in 1983 with the first ever Corvette TV commercial, with special effects and a laser show. Chevrolet presented a completely reworked vehicle with numerous improvements in aerodynamics, layout and spaciousness, and featuring electronic instruments for the first time. In 1986, a new convertible appeared, the first for 11 years. The Corvette increasingly developed into a performance-oriented luxury sports car with air conditioning, six-speed transmission and airbags. Sales boomed and in 1992 the millionth Corvette came off the production line. In 1996 GM presented the new version of the Grand Sport, one of the most famous Corvette racing cars of all. Thanks especially to its 330 horsepower LT4 engine with six-speed manual transmission, this special limited edition in the original racing colors of 1963 did full justice to its namesake and the racing character of the Corvette.
1997, for the fifth time, a new Corvette saw the light of day, and without doubt, the best ever to roll off the Bowling Green production line. The engineers had completely redesigned it, with not a single part taken over from a previous series. But the Corvette still remained true to its basic principles, and above all, its elegant lines. The CW value of 0.29 was the lowest of all vehicles produced by General Motors. The C5 amazed everyone, especially with its rear-mounted transmission and the new small-block V8 engine made of aluminium. The particular strength of the 344-horsepower LS1, its perfect combination of performance, torque, consumption, smooth running and long life. And its special construction also guarantees an optimum balance of nearly 50-50. Drive-by-wire, automatic tyre pressure monitoring, and since 1998 an active handling system and the head-up display bring a unique driving pleasure to the fascinating Corvette. Those who love their Corvettes want to enjoy their distinct character to the full. That's why for some years now, General Motors has been offering a special type of driving course, Corvette Performance Training. Over 400 Corvette potential and actual owners from all over Europe take part in this customized course every year. They want to learn how to handle their cars better, especially in extreme situations. The Bosch testing ground at Boxberg in 2002. Performance training for around 50 sports car enthusiasts who are initiated into the secrets of handling the Corvette by qualified instructors. First comes the theory, then the practice. Concentrated and targeted counter steering on slippery road surfaces. It's a highly serious exercise, but that doesn't stop it being fun as well. The participants aren't competing against each other or against the clock. They're learning consummate vehicle control in an enjoyable fashion. Next on the program is one of the most important maneuvers for everyday driving. ABS full braking at a speed of 100 km per hour and avoiding an obstacle. The exercise involves stepping on the brakes abruptly, forcefully and with full strength so that the anti-lock braking system kicks in and the Corvette remains controllable. Controlling a sports car as powerful and agile as the Corvette, even under difficult conditions, while still experiencing the full enjoyment potential of the car. That's the declared teaching aim of this performance training. And it of course includes driving at over 200 kilometers an hour on the high-speed oval of the testing ground. Perfect mastery of a super sports car in extreme conditions. What the professionals so impressively demonstrate here can be learned by everyone. With the Corvette in performance training by General Motors. The legend lives on. After nearly 50 exciting and successful years, there's only one question for the Corvette and its fans throughout the world. What's it going to be like, the next Corvette generation? Whether faster, bigger, more modern, or closer to its predecessors, the new sports car will continue the tradition of pure driving pleasure. Long live the Corvette!